Welcome to Pello Talk. In this episode, we'll review The Guardian's sensational dog whistle reporting of the widely known fact that the PM is Christian with Christian beliefs. Quote, Scott Morrison tells Christian Conference he was called to do God's work as Prime Minister. End quote. And right on cue, bigoted leftists are barking their heads off. Also, I'll have a look at the surprisingly conservative content of Prime Minister Bob Hawke's 1988 speech to the American Congress, and what lessons Labor and Liberal Premiers and Prime Ministers alike can learn from that today. How far we've come. George Christensen joins me to discuss his plans for the short time remaining in his political career and what happens next. And I educate a fact-repellent ABC fan who doesn't understand the concept of truth. I'm Dave Pello, and this is Pello Talk. Oh, it's not enough to do nothing. It's time for us to do something. Scott Morrison tells Christian Conference he was called to do God's work as Prime Minister. That was the Guardian headline late this week on an article by Sarah Martin, that progressive platform's chief political correspondent. Yes, the Guardian journalists are quite open about the fact that their blog has a political agenda. I find it quite amazing when anyone I'd normally respect or who would hope anyone else would respect them quotes The Guardian as if they're a reliable source. They are not. They are progressive activists with a transparently radical left social and political agenda. If you give their perspective more than a pinch of salt in value on anything about people they disagree with, for example, authentic Christians or conservatives or their sworn nemesis, Christian conservatives who dare to express ideas which were mainstream up until about five minutes ago, then you are vastly overvaluing the worth of their contributions to public debate. The headline in this case is a prime example. It's just not news. Who doesn't already know that Christians believe we are called to do God's work in whatever vocation or sphere of influence we find ourselves in, from the humble to the notable? Of course the PM believes he is called by God to work as PM. That's God's work. The shock and indignation feigned by these God mockers is embarrassing for them in how ignorant it makes them look. Have they never noticed the similarities between language, minister, ministry? Both come from the same Latin word meaning to serve, from which we also get the word minor, as in less than. It's meant to be a position of humility under authority. The compatibility of Christian service with public service, ministry, is exquisite. To expect that no public servant would ever also be a devoted servant of Christ who fully expresses that in their public service is only possible for folks who simply have such a twisted, bigoted view of Christians that they, ironically, believe Christianity to be toxic, which is an historically unsupportable belief given the track record of all competing alternatives. Our Australian constitution specifically prohibits the possibility of creating any rule to exclude Christians or adherents of any other religion from public office. There is no caveat that explains they can serve the public but mustn't think, speak or act like Christians when they do. Such a rule would be tyrannical and an effective breach of the free exercise and no religious test limbs of section 116 of the Australian Constitution. And in full, it says, Commonwealth not to legislate in respect of religion. The Commonwealth shall not make any law for establishing any religion or for imposing any religious observance or for prohibiting the free exercise of any religion and no religious test shall be required as a qualification for any office or public trust under the Commonwealth. The Guardian and other reactionary Christophobes appear to suggest there should be a religious test to make sure their own secular beliefs and behaviour are a minimum qualification for any office or public trust. They are illiberal and the opposite of inclusive. If SCOMO was trans, 
Far from objecting, they'd celebrate him, proselytizing harmful anti-science beliefs on voters and children because that's what they believe. If ScoMo was Wiccan, they'd celebrate him using his office to evangelize worship of Gaia and legislate green dogma because that's their religious devotion. And if he was Aboriginal, they'd insist he pray to dead ancestors before every meeting and conduct religious smoking ceremonies to ward off evil spirits instead of cutting the ribbon for new infrastructure. But he's Christian, and there's no tolerance, inclusion or pluralism which extends that far for the radical left, ABC and Guardian. But I repeat myself. Hysterical shrieks of THEOCRACY are still reverberating around the terrified Twitterverse and lying harlot media as people recoil to descriptions of the nation's leader describing how he sometimes quietly prays for God's blessing on people as he gives them a welcome embrace following a natural disaster. What's wrong with mixing religion and politics? Again, that's nothing new. And the idea that Christianity is somehow a threat to democracy is willfully ignorant of the history of Australia and the world. In fact, the only clear and present danger to democracy is those Christophobic bigots in the lying harlot media hell-bent on imposing their grand visions of woketopia on the rest of us by crusading for the separation of religion and politics. Here's what Dr. Stephen Shavira, a speaker at this year's Church and State Summit and expert in political history, had to say to those fearing the hyperbolized theocracy. Yeah, I've been seeing on Twitter today, Jane Carroll and others criticizing Scott Morrison for mixing religion and politics and thereby dragging Australia down the path to theocracy. Well, here's the thing. Religion and politics have always mixed in Australia. Do you know why? Because Australian citizens have, for most of Australian history, been very religious. Uh, we've always had many religious MPs. We've had clergy MPs. We've had the Labour Party, which was deeply influenced by uh, evangelical Christianity. And then after World War I, it was deeply influenced by Catholicism. The Liberal Party's ideals were deeply influenced by Christianity in Sir Robert Menzies. We've had religion always influence our public ceremonies. Uh, Anzac Day, the ceremony was invented by Canon David Garland, an Anglican minister, which is why it's such a religious ceremony. We've had governments always uh, supporting uh, Christian charities. The idea that mixing religion and politics in Australia is somehow going to undermine our democracy is ridiculous because we became one of the greatest democracies in the, democracies in the world while most Australians were deeply Christian and while religion and politics mixed all the time. If you don't like mixing religion and politics, why don't you check out some of the countries where religion and politics have been separated, like, for example, North Korea or China. And you'll see that the only way uh, to separate religion and politics in countries where the overwhelming majority of people identify as religious, and in Australia in 2016, only 30% said they were of no religion. And you'll see that the only way to do it is basically by removing removing the civil rights of religious people and removing any possibility that they can have any influence in politics at all. In other words, turn Australia into a secularist totalitarian country because that's how you separate religion and politics. You know, if you don't really want to go down that path, then I've got another suggestion. Don't vote for religious people. Most of our population has been very religious for most of our history. Claims about a growing statistic of ticking the no religion box are irrelevant if everyone has the right to choose who represents them. The problem for godless progressives is if they let you choose a Christian conservative, you just might. The only observable threat to democracy in Australia today is the totalitarian left wanting to remove the civil rights of Christians to fully participate in public service with all of their religious identity or to even permit voting for representatives of their culturally Christian values and beliefs. They are terrified too many of us will vote the same way in the next federal election and return a Pentecostal Christian to the seat of power they crave for themselves. In 1988, Russia was called the USSR and was led by General Secretary Gorbachev. Ronald Reagan was the President of the United States, and our Prime Minister was Bob Hawke, leader of the Labour Party. 
The Labour Party of the 80s bore absolutely no resemblance to the anti-family, anti-jobs, radical Green Party it has become today. It is a strange sensation to listen to the ideas they had back when a right-thinking person could sometimes agree with a Labour leader and maybe even say, hear, hear. Take, for example, this speech by Prime Minister Bob Hawke to a joint meeting of the US Senate and the House of Representatives in the middle of 1988. I'll start with what should be a moment of patriotic pride for all Australians, the long and rousing ovations for our PM, and by extension, us, a reflection of the deep connection between our two close nations, not one, but two, before he even said a word. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister of Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the proud privilege, and I count it a high personal honor, to present the chosen head of a great nation, a fair, a free, and a friendly people, the Prime Minister of Australia, the Honorable Robert J. L. Hawke. Speaker, Mr. President, members of Congress, friends. By inviting me to speak today to the Congress of the United States, you honour not only the Prime Minister of Australia, but you honour all Australians. God bless America. You know, in no small part, our own founders borrowed heavily from the American experiment to create our own republic, mingling it with the best of our British identity and political legacy to improve upon both. Ours is a better system of government than the American one, immune from the worst abuses of executive power by having an Australian head of state who reserves those powers from the government and the inevitable bad characters who may occasionally rise to the Prime Minister's office. Our PM is accountable to the Governor General he or she chooses and may be simply and peacefully dismissed by them to face a new election if the Prime Minister loses the confidence of the House, is unable to secure budget approval for his or her agenda, or is known to be acting unconstitutionally. In this way, we have better secured our democratic republic against executive tyranny. And Bob Hawke noted our shared value for power being vested in the people. The concept of government of the people, by the people, for the people, is as potent today as it was two centuries ago, when that remarkable collection of farmers, lawyers, traders and intellectuals met in Philadelphia to craft a constitution. Although democracy 
is not the guiding precept of government in most nations. It is assuredly the guiding precept in those nations which have successfully delivered to their citizens a decent quality of life and a high standard of living. And as we approach the 21st century, no nation can fail to note that example. The Western democracies can lead with self-confidence and they have no need of self-doubt. A decent quality of life and a high standard of living. Hear, hear. That is the historical result of freedom and limited government. Now listen to this remarkable bit of classical liberalism, recently abandoned by the new authoritarian big government beliefs of the Labor Greens coalition. Here, Labor PM Bob Hawke endorses, quote, the values of individual liberty, the equality before the law, and the supremacy of people over the state, end quote. Someone share this, please, with Daniel Andrews, Mark McGowan, and Nanastasia Palaszczuk. American and Australian interests and views may at times diverge, but it is the values of individual liberty, equality before the law and the supremacy of people over the state to which we can always with confidence return as a powerful and uniting force. It's a half hour speech, so I won't play it all. You can find the link in the post for this episode on goodsource.news. Here are some of the highlights for me, though. The American contribution to our bicentennial celebrations has added a special dimension to our relationship. If I were to describe it all in its detail, I fear I would be accused, at least under Senate rules, of a filibuster. Let me just say how greatly we welcome the opportunity to celebrate this great occasion, this great year in Australia, with a very special friend. Mr Speaker, Mr President, it is because of the deep similarities between our two nations that my predecessor, Australia's wartime Prime Minister John Curtin, was able to declare in 1944 that Australians look forward to, and I quote his words, an uninterrupted friendship with the people of the United States. Curtin said those words in San Francisco on his way to talks with President Franklin Roosevelt concerning the conduct of the war in which Australians and Americans were fighting side by side in defence of liberty in the South Pacific. And I wish to state clearly that Australia and the United States are not just friends. We are allies. Bob Hawke defended Donald Trump's policy of demanding allies carry their own weight. The United States has every right to see alliances as two-way streets, to expect that allies carry their weight. And I assure you that Australia is and will remain such an ally. He also agreed, unlike China, strong allies should not be exposed to aggressive trade protectionism, but a fair go. Mr Speaker, Mr President, you can therefore see why we believe our relationship entitles us to a fair go in our trade with the United States and in competition with the United States in third markets. Not, I emphasise, special favours but a fair go. This is not the occasion to make detailed representations about particular export commodities. But it would be wrong of me here in Congress to pretend that within our otherwise excellent relationship, trade is not an area of very real concern to us. And I should say to you with the frankness which I trust is permitted to a friend, that some of the decisions made in Washington intended to defend the interests of Americans have turned out, in fact, to hurt Australians. In particular, Australia's primary producers are unsubsidised and are among the most efficient in the world. And yet, 
We are finding ourselves squeezed out of markets by practices which distort prices and levels of production. In agriculture, we find ourselves caught in the crossfire of a destructive and counterproductive transatlantic subsidies war. The statistics are graphic. Since your export enhancement program has been operating, America's share of the world wheat market has jumped from 29 to 43 per cent. The European community share has fallen only a little, from 17 to 14 per cent, but Australia's share has slumped from 20 to 12 per cent. The subsidies war is costing us, and I mean both of us, not just economically. There is also an impact a damaging impact upon the perceptions which Australians have of the major trading powers, the United States included. And Australians must not be given reason to believe that while we are as we are first-class allies, we are in trade second-class friends. Strong words, and I have to say, persuasive. Speaking about international relations, but profoundly true of all politics, Hawke also gave this warning, something I now hear 33 years later, in light of the immense transaction of fundamental freedom for false promises of safety in the nature of public health directives, as well as his words valuing individual liberty, equality before the law, and the supremacy of people over the state. But no man or woman who has lived in the 20th century can fail to understand how quickly and how disastrously change can come. We still face many challenges, many dangers. Intractable and tragic conflicts persist in the Middle East and Southern Africa. Famine, war and disease still haunt many parts of the third world. Hundreds of millions of people still lack the freedom and human rights that we take for granted in our countries. And recent events have even disrupted the relative tranquility of the South Pacific. So we must always remember that nothing is preordained. The future does not just happen to us, we make the future. And if we are to make it well, we need to remain engaged with the world willing to struggle with its problems and to take our part in solving them. We live in an interdependent world and we don't have the practical option or indeed the moral option to sit it out. Prime Minister Bob Hawke's speech to the joint sitting of, of Congress in the year of Australia's bicentenary was concluded with these words. Mr Speaker, Mr President, I have not the slightest doubt of the unique capability of the United States for leadership, whether in managing the pivotal relationship with the Soviet Union, maintaining the health of the Western Alliance, forging further agreements in the essential area of arms control, seeking solutions to regional issues such as the Middle East and Southern Africa, or resolving international economic problems. If all of this sounds like a tall order, if it sounds like an unfair burden, we do not look to the United States to save all, solve all these problems alone or to mount the effort without the help of friends. We ask only that the United States continue to contribute the strength, the persistence, the creativity and the breadth of vision which, to the immense benefit of all mankind, have been the hallmarks of the American character. And I am confident that it will be so. No nation in the world surpasses the United States in justifiable pride in past achievements, confidence that problems can be overcome, and contagious optimism about the future. Neither of us would claim that our nation is without blemish. Neither of us would claim that governments of our countries have always chosen wisely or acted well. But I do say this, that when all is said and done, the United States is a great and a good country, that the people of the United States are a great and a good people. 
and that in Australia in the years ahead you will have the very best kind of friend, independent to be sure, forthright in the defence of our own interests certainly, but also firmly supportive and deeply proud of our rich and enduring relationship. Early in 2017 I started my YouTube channel and it hasn't grown very much since then. But I've been greatly encouraged by the friends I've made along the way and my next guest is someone who had every right to not bother with this obscure blogger when I first contacted him. I was impressed from afar by his candidness in an age of politicians playing it safe, constantly afraid of risking their re-elections and party discipline at the cost of their electorate's rigorous fearless representation. I wanted to meet him, and so I called his office and asked for an interview. Fortuitously, he was stopping in Brisbane on his way home from Canberra, and was able to arrange a gap in his flight so he could come into my temporary studio. There was none of the pretension of a popular politician who had nothing to gain from attention outside his electorate. I slid the front passenger seat in my old green Camry as far back as it would go, and he climbed into a stranger's car in the middle of the Brisbane CBD. He is known as the most outspoken member of the Nationals, fearlessly critical of regressive liberal policies like redefining marriage, the misnamed safe schools curriculum, halal certification, raiding superannuation, and taxing the climate. Most enjoyably for those of us thoroughly disillusioned by the self-serving careerism of most politicians, he is skeptical of so-called party discipline, the philosophy that politicians represent their party instead of their electorate and aren't entitled to dissenting opinions. Welcome, Mr. Christensen. Thanks very much, David. You know, we, we, if Christians um, and conservatives uh, vacate the space and don't actually go into politics and stand up for the principles that they espouse, someone else is going to fill that void. Do we want that void filled? with people who are going to be having views that are completely contrary to our own. That's right. And that has been a recurring view that I've had mm. uh, throughout all my political career. There is a reason that we must put our hand up and go in and do the service. Mm. And that is because, uh, sadly, our political enemies will do, uh, will do it otherwise. George, I want to thank you very much for your friendship over the last four years. I Thanks, expected Dave. a political interview. <laughs> and and I found maybe one of my own man crushes, uh, <laughs> somebody who's a Christian and conservative and into Doctor Who and other sci-fi things, somebody who loves a robust debate, um, doesn't feel insulted by, by disagreement, uh, somebody who puts conviction before career. Uh, before I met you, I was impressed by the decision to step aside from the position of authority and responsibility and extra pay as a whip in the Federal National Party um, so that you could speak more robustly uh, and with a little less party discipline about mm -hmm. the issues uh, that you felt were most important as you represented uh, your federal electorate of Dawson in North Queensland. Um, so it's, it's been a, a thrill. It's been one of the payoffs of, of the, the labour that this often is to have um, forged that friendship with you. And I, I um, thank God for that very much. And obviously, thank you for uh, willing to trust me and um, and uh, take me into your confidence on some things. Oh, well, thank you, Dave. And it's been uh, a pleasure actually being uh, part of the Good Source team. It's been, uh, and it's something I'm gonna continue. In fact, uh, 
we're looking at kicking off um, the podcasts again, and we got some uh, big names that are going to that is appearing on that podcast. Any uh, confirmed names you can uh, sneak peek right now? Well, it could be a former prime minister, maybe. Uh, we just need to lock that in. I'm so, uh, not sure if we want Malcolm Turnbull on this <laughs> channel. <laughs> It'll be a robust discussion if it is Malcolm. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> actually, something you wouldn't have seen yet, but uh, in the former part of this uh, episode, uh, I've highlighted some quotes from uh, Bob Hawke's address to the joint session of Congress in our bicentenary year of 1988, where he was advocating the rights of individuals over the state. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, yeah so times have changed. I know yeah. he's unavailable um, for your podcast, mm -hmm. uh, sadly passed on, um, but he was in this episode, so maybe it was a different former prime minister. What's actually catalyzed for you? What's, what's the reasons, um, the, if there's more than one, yeah. the, the most important reasons why you've decided to um, you call it a career and, and, yeah. and make family uh, yeah. more important now? Well, look, there's many reasons for uh, why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, uh, one is, is family. Uh, David, you know I've got a a relatively newborn daughter. I actually am not entirely sure that uh, political life, particularly going down to Canberra all the time, is conducive to new family life. So mm. uh, that has been playing on my mind. I've got to say, it's not the only reason that perhaps in and of itself uh, that may have not um, seen me take the course of action that we've taken. But uh, there is a big reason, and I've said it before, and I'll probably keep on talking about it to explain it further, and that is we've got a broken politics in Australia. And I've come to that conclusion. Uh, it's broken for the conservative agenda, for getting that conservative agenda moving forward. And it has to be said, we've had, um, you know, for, well, since 2013, um, uh, ostensibly conservatives in power apart from that labor light interregnum of the Turnbull government um, so but where has the conservative agenda um, largely advanced um, yes there's been some wins some small wins a lot of them though are simply staving off the lunacy of the left right uh, but still it just seems that our political uh, agenda in this country just keeps on veering to the left. So there's a problem there. Uh, I think I understand a bit about that problem and I can wax lyrical on it. Uh, what I don't understand fully yet is the solution. But I want to put my mind to that because I think the problem is culture. And culture, uh, politics is downstream of culture. Mm. Um, uh, and, and, and it's more than just culture, it's the cultural institutions. And if you just allow me, I will wax, wax, yeah, wax lyrical on, on this broken politics. Scott Morrison talks about the Canberra bubble, and he's absolutely right. There is a Canberra bubble. If I think that's what Corey call coined it. the phrase. Did he? Well, yeah. there you go. Well, uh, Corey's Scott a very, picked it up. very, very smart man, uh, Corey Bernardi. And uh, there is a Canberra bubble, though. Mm. And um, uh, maybe I'm, uh, I'm, I'm misusing the term from what they mean, but you've got... The mainstream media, um, not all of them, but a lot of them, yeah, uh, who are activists. They on, are activists. on this channel. We call it the lying harlot media. Yeah, well, the lying harlot media, the lamestream media, the <laughs> fake news media, whatever you like to call them, they pretend that they are impartial observers and reporters of what goes on. But these guys set the agenda. They then uh, run stories which pushes one angle of that agenda. And uh, they, they, they also do something else, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. But they set a narrative. Now, it's more than just them. And sometimes they work in cahoots, like you see the ABC and Four Corners working with some group that's on the taxpayer teat uh, uh, to, to come up with a story and then a campaign, mm. which continues a story. So we've got all these groups, um, you know, the get-ups of the world and all the rest of them that... Uh, that try and drive agendas in the political system, and we don't have much on the right to counter that, and we certainly don't have uh, the media apparatus to help push the narratives. Um, but, but, but there's more than that. There's people that are firmly ensconced within the bowels of bureaucracy in Canberra that are part of this Canberra bubble. 
They all push in the one direction. They all have the same like-mindedness. If there was a dinner party and you invited all these people that are part of the Canberra bubble to it, there'd be no arguments. They'd all be in furious agreement with each other. But if you invited an average Aussie to it, particularly one from my part of the world, there would be heated debate because they are just so poles apart. Mm. Uh, and um, that's the problem. These institutions have simply drawn a circle around what is legitimate political discourse. And if you veer outside of that circle, uh, they, the, the media then go into action. They don't just attack what you're saying, and even though they shouldn't be attacking what you're saying, they should be debating the issue, but they don't just attack what you're saying now, they try to cancel the person. So yeah. we've heard about cancel culture a lot. Yeah. Uh, it literally happens and has happened for some time in the media. Now, I know that there may be people that say, oh, well, uh, you know, um, I can use the example of Barnaby Joyce. They might say, oh, well, Barnaby did wrong. Uh, I've got to tell you, other politicians, uh, I won't name names, but other politicians on the other side of the fence uh, did exactly the same thing Glass houses. that Barnaby did, mm. and yet there was not reporting about what they did. And the question is, why is that? Why was it? that Barnaby Joyce was pilloried and hunted out of his role as Deputy Prime Minister for something that barely raised an eyebrow. And this is why I insist on calling them the lying harlot media. It's not just that they're maliciously deceitful. It's also that they have prostituted themselves. They, They should be faithful to the public. They should have integrity and purity in their reporting and narration and commentary, and they should at the very least declare their biases and agendas like we do at The Good Source. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're transparent, you know what we're trying to do. We're not pretending to be uh, journalists, and and yet I think because of that transparency, we're more reliable than The Guardian. Uh, But um, they've actually prostituted themselves. They've exchanged that purity and faithfulness that they have a social contract for in exchange for clicks, and in exchange for preferred outcomes, mm. and in exchange for literal currency. Yep. Uh, they've built their careers out of being activists instead of being the fourth estate and, and, exposing, and exposing realities and facts and promoting robust debate between two sides of an argument. So often the debate is just about degrees of difference. Like, very few people are for actually closed borders, and very few people are for actually wide open, yeah, yeah. unfiltered immigration. And so sometimes the difference between left and right is do you believe in 50,000 or 500,000 immigration per year? And, and let's talk about, and then, mm-hmm. and then instead of exposing a good debate, they'll cancel, like you said, one entire side of the debate by calling them racist and bigots and xenophobes and Islamophobes and and every other name which cancels them from being worthy of even being contemplated in the conversation. That's why they're the lying harlot media, because they're not just deceitful, but they're actually, uh, you know, faithless Mm. in the execution of their job. It's more than just the media, though, but but they are are right at the the front of Mm. this uh, of this problem. Uh, but look, you're right, it's, it's now cancel culture. They don't want to debate the topic. They want to take out the people that are advocating the positions that they don't like. Uh, they demonise them by calling them racists or sexists or whatever it may be, you know, whatever's the flavour of the month in terms of the latest politically correct woke crusade. Mm. Um, and they'll try and take people out. Uh, it's just so wrong. And it's dangerous, extremely dangerous to democracy. And if something isn't done about it, and this is easy to say because I don't have the solution, but unless we can tackle this problem, it doesn't matter whether we elect Labor governments in the future or Liberal National Coalition governments, Mm. our political uh, agenda is just keep going to keep on going towards more and more the left. Uh, and, so true. And, and, you know, right now... Until civilization collapse. Well, yeah, without a doubt. And, and it, 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 it will. I mean, uh, the, um, I had an old lecturer uh, who was a conservative, one of the few at universities. He, at university used to say, uh, 
a welfare society is a farewell society. Um, in other words, uh, bye bye. You know, right, right. and it is going to go that way. Um, if we keep on going more and more yeah. uh, towards the left, and it's now just not economics, it's now uh, culture. It's, so is uh, it uh, a so large much. sense of futility that's driving part of your your dis- decision to... Uh, futility, uh, look, that's a, it's, uh, I, I don't want to dissuade anyone from getting involved in politics, uh, not at all, but it just needs to be said that we're doing the same thing over and over and not getting any different result. And I guess that there's uh, a definition of insanity that's around that. Mm. So I think it's time to do something different that tries to trigger a different result. And so I'm still going to be involved in politics. People How? said, are you quitting politics? No way. Um, I'm very interested in what happens in the future of my country. Uh, I'm very interested in the trajectory that Good. we're going down. Mm. And I'll continue to speak up, speak out probably more unfiltered than I have before. Um, and uh, and <laughs> there's some people that get scared when they hear that. They thought, wow, it wasn't unfiltered before, but uh, no, no, I haven't been. And uh, I, I, I've filtered myself. Of course you have. Because uh, you have to. Yeah. Because if you don't, you're going to get cancelled. You've um, been less filtered than many of your colleagues. Yeah. Uh, and that's great. And it's a shame that they feel the need to... Bridle some, themselves so much. Some of them are scared, and I'm not going to name names. No, so, but, but, I, but, and but, but you know, I talk to. Well, <laughs> I get up in the party room and I say something, and uh, I get like you know about half a dozen or more text messages saying, "Oh, good on you, George, for saying that." And then people coming up in the corridors, "Yeah, yeah, good on you." Uh, Corey's where, testimony was the same you, before mate? he left where politics. <laughs> he Corey would say. I would get these people. We're, we're yeah, glad yeah. you speak because you're saying what we think, and he's like, "Well, why are you leaving me by myself?" Um, and and it is cowardly but, and but, it is a shame. But, and, but uh, look, this I, is what I said when I first interviewed you: yeah. is that's my role and that's the audience's role, is to put wind in the sails and steel in the spine of our representatives or fire them. Can I can I just push back on the cowardly thing though? Um, sure, might be a bit harsh. Well, it is because it's the arena that you're in, and again, I talk about the Canberra bubble that have drawn that circle. People know what's going to happen to them if they stray out outside the circle. Uh, what's going to happen to them? They're going to lose their career. And uh, people have got Isn't families. Isn't that worth it, though? Um, Do it well. So, so some people, but you, you, you're, you're right, but some people may have a thought that I can tread softly, softly, and get somewhere softly, softly with this. Um, and they might think that in all good conscience and uh, with the best of intentions. Oh, I believe their the, intentions the, the, are pure there. The, but The problem is that at some point along that journey, uh, the softly, softly becomes never, never. And, uh, mm. you know, and, and then people lose spirit and they lose all sort of uh, perspective. I didn't want to get to that stage. Uh, so now I'm free to speak out. Uh, I'm going to speak out a lot more on issues. You've that I'm done four about. terms. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's uh, and it's four tours of duty that are. Uh, you've done Canberra. four terms, <laughs> and and despite the best and concentrated efforts yeah. of the leftist media complex, yeah. um, they have the assassinated your character yeah. till the cows come home, made the most obscene insinuations in the national press mm-hmm. um, about you, and you have increased your support and mm. popularity and respect in your electorate. Mm. Uh, the haters are always going to hate. Yep. The leftists are always going to hate. I repeat myself. <laughs> uh, but, but you know, respect to you. And, and this is why I don't shrink back from calling it cowardly, is mm. because personally, I would, if I got elected to government, I would rather blaze out spectacularly in one term, having lived to my convictions. I don't mean cavalier recklessness. I'm not advocating silliness. Um, but there, there is a, a degree... You know, Mark Robinson here in Queensland is somebody who's, like you, proudly Christian, an ordained minister, mm. uh, very pro-life, staunchly known for his anti-abortion stances, and has been, again, focused attacks on him. And I maintain... That examples like you and he and and a very few others show that 
courage under fire doesn't necessarily have to cost you your career. Um, but I also understand with the best of intentions, there's those people with perhaps slightly less courage, if, if that's the gentler way of putting it, who need us to, to, I guess, carrot and stick is the best way of saying it. 100%. To reward them for courage and say, we've got your back. We're not just going to see you on election day and, and hand out flyers for two hours and give you 20 bucks. We're actually going to have your back in letters to the editor and social media and volunteering and and you know things that you can use and 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 ask you what yep. what will help you uh, in the party room can we join the party and make sure you don't lose pre-selection mm. um, can you know what can we do to make sure that when you actually represent our values with courage um, that that you're not left alone abandoned but you've actually got fuel in the tank for the journey and there needs to be a lot more of that uh, because you know the media amplifies things greatly mm. when it comes to uh, uh, negativity, and so you feel that you do feel it as a politician. You think the world's collapsing in on you. Uh, you think you're going to lose, um, and and you do get a bit dispirited from time to time. You also get the uh, the hate mail uh, from the, the haters that got to hate, and you get the activist groups like Get Up and the Union Movement or. Uh, now, whatever flavour of the month there is in terms of a campaign, all emailing you, attacking you, saying you've got to do X, Y and Z, which you disagree with. Um, what you don't get so much of is people supporting you for taking a stance. Some, it, I've actually noticed in recent times that's grown a bit stronger. Um, awesome. There, there, there are more people, but um, probably still not as much as the other side. And so mm. I think that if people people agree with what someone said or done, they really need to pat them on the back more than that, offer them what support they can offer them. Yeah. Um, it's just so important because otherwise, if you're out there and you're trying to fight on a particular issue and all you're getting is criticism from the media, criticism from the left, criticism on Facebook from the keyboard warriors and Twitter from the keyboard warriors, mm and from the groups that are out there, all the groups on the taxpayer teat, you know, uh, and, and you, where's my friends? You know, you're looking around, like, where, where, where's all the support? Where, you just think to yourself, well, uh, I better get off the field here because this fight's too great for me. Mm. Um, so there needs to be much more support for conservatives. That's, uh, uh, if there's a parting message that I've got to people, it is, it is that, that yeah. they really need to get behind strong conservatives. But can I just go back to one other important point? Um, they are people who are in the arena. Uh, and I think the arena at the moment, it's akin to the, you know, the boy sticking his finger into the dam wall, stopping the, the lunacy of the left from you know, flooding, uh, flooding us all. Wendy Francis called it a tsunami the other day. Yeah, well, it would be a tsunami if, mm. we, uh, if we burst the dam wall. And there's people that want to burst the dam wall. So we also need to all collectively try and put our minds to how we change the culture. And the culture starts with us. Uh, culture's made up of, of people yep. and our views. And so if we bottle it up and we succumb to cancel culture, uh, we succumb to political correctness and we don't want to tell other people uh, our side of the story, our arguments, our ideas for fear that they're going to delete us off Facebook or they're mm -hmm. going to not invite us to a party or that they're going to, you know, do something nasty to us. Well, we may as well pack it up and all go home and, yeah. you know, migrate to Poland or Hungary where uh, it looks like that sort of... Uh, <laughs> That's right. That white culture's been kicked to the dustbin, but uh, anyway. Conservative refuge. Yeah, yeah. I uh, very deliberately made a decision not to seek election because I had a young family. Um, and I just essentially swore that not while they're at school. Um, so I think, you, I think you're making the right decision. It's, it, it, I agree. Uh, you, your kids are a more important priority. Um, public service has a season. Um, and, and that's before kids, in your case, and, and I don't know what the future holds for me, but um, I, I know that if, if more people focused on making sure the kids were healthy and balanced and had two parents present at home, 
are two married biological parents present at home, um, then then Australia would that would be a great way of waging the culture war. To get married and raise mm. your kids together, mm. um, and that that would be uh, a huge step and we would fix a lot in a generation with that. We don't talk about it as much, David, but uh, for conservatives, um, family is the bedrock of society. And, uh, you know, I remember having a conversation with Lyle Shelton, uh, who's now going off to wage uh, war on his own in the New South Wales Parliament, and good luck <coughs> to him. Uh, God bless him and, and all power to him, uh, mm. strength to his hand. Um, but we had a discussion many moons ago when he was the head of the Australian Christian Lobby and they came up with a report uh, that was titled For Kids Sake and what it was about is the breakdown of families, dysfunctional families growing in our community and all the problems that's stemming from that and you know um, probably the one regret that I've had is not focusing as much as what I should have on that because beyond all the culture war stuff, you know, we've got a problem. Do you mean in legislation battles that you were fighting? Policy? Policy battles because it's just so difficult. Um, you know, uh, uh, we've got family dysfunction. What's driving family dysfunction? What's driving uh, the disintegration of relationships? What's driving, um, you know, divorce rates? What's driving mm. uh, family breakups? Uh, domestic violence, uh, child abuse, um, what's driving all of that sort of mm. stuff. Uh, now the left would jump and say oh, it's poverty or something like that or oh, it's domestic violence, it's sexism and it's patriarchal Something far away from or personal something responsibility. Like but you know, it, it is about personal responsibility but it's also about uh, understanding your self-worth, it's understanding what a healthy relationship is. And we have a problem in this country mm. where there, it's now generational, uh, systemic generational family dysfunction. Absolutely. And uh, we wonder why the culture's breaking down yeah. because the bedrock. That's probably a whole episode in down. itself. It's a, it's a really full and large topic. Yeah. Um, one of the things you regret is perhaps not focusing more on, on kids and, and family traditional family structures in in policy um, but surely I know you've done a lot of really amazing things and achieved a lot for your electorate but I would have to say personally one of the um, bills that is most applaudable and, and I pray success for it mm. is the one that's currently on the table and that's yeah. the uh, you'll give me the full uh, legal name but it's the the born alive protection act Yep. Um, and uh, I, I guess I'd just ask you to take three minutes, uh, recapitulate that for anybody that might not have heard about it yet, yeah, yeah, and what sure. they can do to get behind it and support it. Well, quick plug, if you want to read all about it, you can jump on my website, georgechristensen.com.au backslash born alive. It is the Human Rights Children Born Alive Protection Bill 2021. Um, it has not actually been introduced into Parliament as yet, but it's going to be. Uh, I've had it drafted uh, earlier this year. Uh, what it's about is we have children in this country who are born as a result of an abortion procedure, born alive. Mm. Um, so the and, doctors and tried to kill them tried and they managed to get, to get tried, born and survive yep, birth tried anyway. Tried to abort, these are abortion survivors now. And so clearly um, if they're surviving birth, they're uh, Late term, abortion. yeah, yeah. Well, well. Um, Sorry, surviving abortion. Th there's there's a myriad of, uh, and and I want to, you know, I want to put the facts out there and not not fudge this. So Good. you do have some that are uh, probably um, so premature that they would not survive um, being outside the womb, and mm. that is that's a fact. Yeah. Um, but there are others that are born in this country. Uh, who are uh, 22, 23, 24, 25 on, onwards, you know, weeks that um, that that would survive or mm. could survive if the right medical treatment is provided to them. At the moment, um, what happens is they're simply placed in a container um, and put to the side. There's some compassion in some instances where they might wrap the child in. Uh, 
some sort of swaddling or, or, or blanket and give it to the mother or if she so wants um, and try and comfort the mother as the baby dies. Um, but uh, essentially the, the answer to this problem is let the baby die. In fact, it's as, it's as blatant as that in Queensland Health guidelines for medical termination of pregnancy where they actually got a table and it's got all of the, you know, it's a troubleshooting table for abortions and it says, uh, you know, if the child is born alive and it says, um, do not provide uh, life-saving treatments, e.g., um, you know, breathing apparatuses, feeding tubes, etc. cetera, uh, simply document date and time of death. And I think that's almost verbatim wow. what the guidelines say in Queensland. How brutal. So, so it is, is quite brutal. Um, so my bill, uh, look, it's already been canned by the leftist press. Of course. Uh, it's already been canned by some abortionists. Um, but uh, the facts will show that my bill would do nothing but save the life of children who are uh, whose life is viable outside of the womb, and who are already outside of the womb. And who are already outside of the womb. So you know we could have a discussion. The woman's no longer we pregnant. We could say, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm pro-life. I'm pro-choice. Uh, you know, I believe life begins at conception. I believe life begins at birth. Mm. Well, guess what? Uh, we're all on the same page now because the baby's been birthed. It's out in the free world, outside of the womb, an independent living being, uh, a human being, human. who under our, our international covenant on the rights of a child is entitled, and this is where mm. the federal remit comes in, the international covenant on the rights of a child Australia signed up to, the child is entitled uh, to the right to life, the child is entitled to um, access to health care, the child is entitled to not be discriminated against on the basis of their birth uh, for health care. So all of that means that right now Australia is actually in breach of mm. its international covenant uh, that it signed up to and, and so we need to fix that situation. And what my bill would say is that if a child was born, it talks about discrimination and not discriminating against a child on the basis of whether or not it's been born uh, as a result of a termination procedure gone wrong. Um, so if, if a child was born at 26 weeks premature, in normal circumstances, if I can call them normal, there will be a set of circumstances, set of, set of health responses or medical responses yep. that child would receive in order to ensure that child survives. And what I'm saying is if a child is born at 26 weeks as a result of an abortion procedure, that everything that you would do for this child is done for this child Without as well. discrimination. Without discrimination. And the penalty would be potentially up to $440,000 fine, which quite honestly is not enough for a life. Uh, but it could also potentially be deregistration as a doctor. Yeah, it should um, be. So, so, or as a Good. medical professional or med medical practitioner. So that's what my bill would do. And I encourage people again, georgechristensen.com.au backslash born alive. Sign up your support because um, we're going to run this. I'm going to run this as hard as I can. Is that enough? Is there anything else people can do? Is there instructions on what else they can do on your um, website? I know that the Australian Christian Lobby and Family Voice and Cherish Life are all running their own separate campaigns on this uh, where you can go to their websites and you can contact members, other members of parliament. I just encourage you, if you've got a Liberal or National Member of Parliament or uh, a Senator in your state, contact them and tell them to please support this private member's bill. Is there any crossbench support? Any uh, I've had a bipartisan crossbencher. support? Um, well, I haven't heard anything from the other side. Of Zero the, Labor members are interested. I, I haven't heard anything from any Labor member. Have I you have approached heard any from, that you think are, are um, approachable? Uh, to be quite honest, I haven't approached any. Um, uh, so It'd be great to get a Labor co-sponsor. It, it would have been good to get a Labor co-sponsor. I don't know who on that side would um, that I would approach, so that's the difficulty. Uh, uh, look, I believe there know. are some that are open to sympathetic approaches to reducing ab abortions. Um, Probably and, more and, in the Senate. And aren't as hardcore as many of the members of Emily's list. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it is hard for them too. Um, 
I have had a lot of my Liberal and National colleagues actually reach out and tell me that they support it from ministers down. So uh, that's I, I can't think of a reason why anybody right of centre wouldn't yeah. instantly say this is a no-brainer, this is the least a civilised, mature society um, can do. The Correct. least. Correct. This is the least. Yep. Um, and, and again, this is a big topic that I could spend an hour on with you together. So, I mean, if, 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 you know, the... Uh, the parting shot that I've got, uh, you know, before I uh, leave the hallowed halls of uh, Parliament House is uh, uh, getting a vote on this and, you know, even getting it through the Parliament uh, as high as that uh, that bar may be, mm. um, that would be good. But at least it's on the Prospects agenda. Prospects as a percentage currently, would you say you're positive? It's always difficult. Uh, I've just got to balance yeah. it with what's realistic in politics. Up, uh, uphill slog. It, it is an uphill slog. Do you have uh, more currency or less uh, now that you're not seeking re-election? Um, uh, is there, is there a... I, I guess I'm yet to find that out. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I think that um, uh, I, I feel more free. I feel uh, ability to say things that I once probably would have been a little bit more guarded about. Um, principally because I don't care what's written about me now because there's no election that people can uh, mm. vote for me or against me on. But uh, so so uh, It's encouraging that they've done their worst and failed. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there are a few people upset about that. But anyway, mm. uh, um, uh, so, so I feel more free and I think that if the ability to speak out should be uh, probably increase my currency, uh, down there in Canberra, but mm. it remains to be seen. Yeah. I look forward to hearing what you have to say without any party discipline. Uh, I can say some of at it all. Now. Go. I can say uh, that we need to build coal fired power stations. I always said that. I can say that climate <laughs> say change. Say something you haven't said climate before. Climate change is crap, uh, complete and utter crap, and this idea of net zero emissions is going to lead to net zero jobs. It's insane. We should pull out of the Paris Agreement. Um, no, I won't yeah, interrupt they, you. We yeah, haven't go got on. time. Go on. No, it's just too many rabbit trails. I want to, want to yeah, keep it under uh, an hour. Mate, uh, what else? Uh, COVID-19. Nuclear. Lockdowns don't work. Uh, masks don't work. Of course. Uh, we, we've, we've, we've mugged yeah. ourselves as a nation uh, with our response to it. So is the entire Western world. So we're not just in the uh, boat by ourselves. Mm. That's still no solace. I mean, people have lost livelihoods and... And, and perhaps some people have lost their lives, not because of COVID-19, oh, but because of some. the horrendous response. I think there'd uh, be thousands yeah, in that score, yeah, yeah. in that column, and the so tally would have to be thousands. So freedom, freedom is under attack. And there freedom will be at least tens of thousands more because of the neglect of so many other areas of our society mm. in years to come. And, and there will be no statistic for COVID directives caused death. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But there will be COVID di directives related deaths. Absolutely, and uh, I think we're seeing a lot of studies that are coming out that are uh, that are showing that. And uh, overall, the uh, the death level in in Australia and in most countries and across the world is no different than what it has been in previous years. So there's been a lot of hype and maybe lot of bad previous years. Uh, so so the the. Other thing that I want to say that's uh, probably a bit controversial, we're going to have to be careful about this globalist push for this great reset um, because that's going to... Still stuff you've said before. But, but, but uh, okay, but I'm going to say it a little bit more furiously now because Good. Uh, this is not a conspiracy. This is for reals. They're, they are actually people that have devised plans that are out there that is this... It's amazing the people that are calling it a conspiracy yeah. theory when it's in plain documentation it's, on their website. We're just put, we're, we're pointing out, uh, have a look at this book. Have a look at this website that the WEF have. Not interested, Have a look at what they? this party says. Oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Hang on, Dick. All I'm telling you is what they're saying. Um, and what they're saying is they no, want a fusion conspiracy factualist. between left leftism, Marxism, mm. and corporatism. It's the most bizarre thing ever. Mm -hmm. And then... I've even said to people the third part of it, which they go, whoa, 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 you've really gone down the rabbit hole. But again, it's all on their website, talking about a fusion between humanity and artificial intelligence. So they're talking about this transhumanism where we're going to be robot wow. uh, or computer human hybrids. It's bizarre stuff, bizarre, bizarre stuff. <laughs> but it actually, this is the agenda that is going to influence um, policy in Western countries across the world 
because all the people that go to it are the movers and shakers. Mm. They're the think tanks. They're the bureaucrats, uh, even politicians. And so you watch some of these ideas that are going to that have been germinated out of the World Economic Forum, this Marxist, globalist, great reset agenda is going to find its way into public policy in Australia. We're just going to have to be so vigilant about it. Yep. So, so vigilant. It's dangerous stuff. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for coming into the studio. Thank uh, you. Thank you for your four terms of, of public service. It's the end of a chapter, but definitely not the end of the story. I'm looking forward to seeing how George Christensen is unleashed on the Australian body politic in the next 20 years. Thanks very much. Um, Thank you very much. What an absolute champion, I'm sure you agree. If there is any treasure to be obtained from the small role I play in the war for the soul of our nation, it's the opportunity to rub shoulders with statesmen like George Christensen, who labours for an audience of one almighty God. For friends and co-laborers like him, I am truly grateful. Earlier this month, the uncompetitive taxpayer-funded broadcaster posted a segment from its failing TV show Q&A with Martin Niles, explaining why Israel Folau was justified in preaching sin, repentance and salvation on his personal social media channels. Vanessa commented beneath the video clip, Freedom of speech ends when your words impede on others' rights. To which I replied, do you mean the imaginary right to not have hurt feelings or the imaginary right to not be confronted with uncomfortable objective moral truth? Ty asked me, what objective moral truth are you referring to? Can you see how that question invalidates itself, cancels itself out? The what in the question implies there is more than one to choose from. But if there was more than one objective truth, you could choose which you preferred, which would no longer be objective, but subjective. I explained this and further observed that what he meant to rigidly assert, as if there was no doubt, was that there was no truth. As the great American thinker Frank Turek explains, the answer to the statement, there is no truth, should always be to ask, is that true? Truth is by definition exclusive of everything not true. Asking what truth suggests irrationally that two mutually exclusive claims can exist simultaneously in reality. The question is an incoherent absurdity which cannot be answered truthfully without ridiculing the question itself. Being a little slow on the uptake, Peter joined the conversation and asked again, who has defined what this truth is Just because you call it the truth doesn't actually make it true. Again, the question denied the objective nature of truth. It is not subjective, a possession, or perspective. It is discovered, revealed, explored, pursued, shared, tested, confirmed. But it is not flexible, partisan, arbitrary, resistible, or cancelable. It just is. Above all, There is no human right to be sheltered from truth. And that is the stumbling block for the moral relativists which litter progressive debate. Society can't progress from truth without the pollution and perversion of it, also called lies and deception. We can pursue truth together. We can get more truth and be relieved of ignorance. We can be aligned with objective reality but we cannot have our own truth. Your perspective is a better label for what you're describing. It humbly acknowledges there are limits to it and realities beyond it. It doesn't claim some haughty moral superiority and refuse to be contradicted. When truth is an obstacle to the supremacy of a person's will and feelings, they kick and buck against it, conflate their ideas with their sacred identity, and claim you've done violence to them as a person, therefore violating their human rights. And that's why Vanessa really believed it when she said, freedom of speech ends when your words impede on others' rights. The very real and God-given natural right to advocate an idea in social media, a blog, meme or video, a sermon or speech or any other communication someone else may be exposed to 
for better or for worse, is simply not abridged or ended when one of those people gets their feelings hurt. People must risk having their feelings hurt by disagreement if there is to be any chance of pursuing truth together, if there is to be any chance of ensuring our public policy, the laws which have real impacts on the lives welfare, prosperity, justice, liberty, and peace of more than 25 million Australians are of the highest quality and standard. We need the highest quality and standard in our laws and, and public policy. Who wants laws founded upon misinformation, bad science, propaganda, prejudice, ignorance, and error? You sit on a throne of lies. Robust debate is essential to expose bad ideas. And the people who object the loudest to free speech are panicking because they have the most to fear from exposure. And so the very most important place to start from, if you want to perpetuate a lie, is to angrily insist there is no truth. Well, tell me what you think of the changes to the Pello Talk format in this episode, if you have any other suggestions or recommendations for future content. I'm going to try prioritizing preparation over schedule for a little while, so I'd really love to know what you think. If you'd like to volunteer to help produce the show, I'm keen to talk. Clip preparation, pre and post production, video editing and broadcast, and content research are all important jobs that need doing. If you're available and local to our Brisbane Southside studio, you might even be able to come help record on our professional set. So much has been achieved already, thanks to the generous Pello Talk partners and Good Source supporters. And if you'd like to see more of this show or the others on the Good Source, please head to the goodsource.news website and click on the support button. I'd like to increase our budget to be able to recruit one of our production volunteers soon, as well as increase our marketing reach. You have an important part to play in disrupting big media and big tech, even if it's just $10 a month. Together we can achieve really big things and return some honesty to politics, debate and culture in Australia. Until next time, God bless. Time for us to do something. Na, 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 na.